way out by Saturn, there's an icy moon called Enceladus. And it's literally spitting out ice into space. And that ice contains the stuff life's made of. Oh, and there's a whole ocean hiding under the ice. And who knows what's living in it? Enceladus is only about 300 miles across. It could literally fit inside the state of Colorado. But even though it's super small, it's got liquid water, energy from hydrothermal vents, and a bunch of chemicals that could actually support life. In other words, it's one of the best spots in the solar system where life could exist. Now, rewind about 20 years. NASA's Cassini spacecraft flew by Saturn and noticed something strange. Enceladus was shooting out little jets of icy particles from cracks near its south pole. Later, scientists realized those jets were coming from a giant underground ocean beneath the moon's surface. When they analyzed the frozen grains from those plumes, they found almost all the elements needed for life. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. Only sulfur was missing. The only problem was, most of those samples came from Saturn's E-ring, a huge ring made of dust and ice that surrounds the planet. And those particles had been sitting out there for decades, maybe centuries, meaning they could have been changed by space radiation. So no one could say for sure if those life ingredients really came from Enceladus itself. But now that's changed. A new study has just confirmed that fresh ice grains, the ones newly blasted out from Enceladus, contain organic molecules, including stuff like nitrogen and oxygen. Here's how scientists figured it out. In 2008, Cassini flew right through one of those icy geysers and it literally got splattered with tiny particles. They hit the spacecraft's dust detector at insane speed, 11 miles per second. That's fast enough to separate all the molecules, so the team could see what they were really made of. Then the scientists used a technique called mass spectrometry and managed to study those fresh grains in detail. They found molecules that on Earth are part of certain chemical reactions. Those build the complex structures life needs to exist, including ones that may contain nitrogen and oxygen. One of the researchers said that this likely proved that those complex organic molecules hadn't formed in space. They might have actually been coming straight from Enceladus's ocean. Another scientist explained that those molecules could play an important role in biological processes. All this means that Enceladus might really be habitable. But even if there's no life there, that's still a big deal. Because then we have the right to ask, wait, why isn't there life when all the right conditions are in place? The story doesn't end there. The European Space Agency is already planning a future mission to actually land on Enceladus, right at its south pole. They want to scoop up more samples and see what's really going on under all that ice. The launch is planned for some time in the early 2040s, so in just a few decades, we might finally find out whether this tiny frozen moon is home to some bizarre life forms. But Enceladus isn't the only potentially habitable place we know about. Admittedly, the others are beyond the edge of our solar system. Like three possible super-Earth planets orbiting a nearby orange dwarf star. Now, super-Earth is just what scientists call planets that are bigger than Earth but smaller than the icy giants like Uranus and Neptune. Scientists from the University of Exeter found that those exoplanets were orbiting their parent star, HD 48498, which sits about 55 light-years away from Earth. That's practically our cosmic neighborhood. Each of these planets takes a different amount of time to go around its star. One needs seven Earth days, another 38 days, and the last one 151 days. And the coolest thing is that the outermost planet might actually be hanging out in the star's habitable zone. That's the sweet spot where it's not too hot and not too cold for liquid water to exist. It means the planet's surface could be comfortable enough for water to exist without boiling or freezing. This makes it a great candidate for life as we know it. Over 10 years, the team collected nearly 190 super precise measurements using cutting-edge equipment that looks at the light coming from stars. 
by checking whether the star's light is slightly shifting toward us. This is called blue shift, or away from us, that's red shift. They can figure out if a planet is tugging on it. The host star itself is an orange dwarf, something like our sun's smaller and calmer cousin. It's similar to the sun in many ways, but as an orange dwarf, it gives off less radiation than our yellow dwarf star does. The coolest part is that this is one of the closest planetary systems we've ever found that hosts a super-Earth in the habitable zone around a sun-like star. Now, super-Earths aren't exactly rare. Scientists have found over 6,000 exoplanets since the first one orbiting a sun-like star was confirmed in 1995. To spot such distant worlds, astronomers use all sorts of tools, like NASA's Kepler telescope, launched in 2009 to find Earth-like planets in the Milky Way. Let's sneak a peek at some of the most exciting exoplanets out there. Gliese 667cc is only 22 light-years away, even though that's still about 129 trillion miles from us. It's about 3.8 times the mass of Earth and zips around its red dwarf star in just 28 days. So a year there is 13 times shorter than ours. Its red dwarf star is cooler, and the planet probably sits in the habitable zone, though occasional stellar flares could give it a sunburn. Kepler 22b is way farther out at 600 plus light years. It was the first Kepler planet found in a habitable zone. It's about 2.4 times bigger than Earth, and we still don't know if it's rocky, liquid, or gaseous. Its orbit is close to Earth's, taking 290 days to circle its G-class star, smaller and colder than our Sun. Kepler 69c is a whopping 2,700 light years away. This planet is almost 70% larger than Earth. Its orbit takes 242 days, putting it in a Venus-like spot in its system. But since its star is only 80% as luminous as our sun, the conditions on that planet might be way friendlier than those on Venus. We discovered TOI 733b in 2023. This world is about 245 light years away. It orbits its star super fast, taking just 4.9 Earth days. But the coolest thing is that it might be completely covered by a massive ocean. Could there be life in that ocean? Time will tell. GJ1214b is 40 light years away, pretty close by space terms. The planet is almost three times Earth's diameter and eight times as heavy. It needs 38 hours to orbit its red dwarf star. The surface temperatures there hit 450 degrees Fahrenheit, and with all that heat and pressure, water behaves in crazy ways, like hot ice or superfluid water. By the way, that superfluidity is wild stuff when water moves like magic without friction. But don't try it on Earth. You'll just get dehydrated. Proxima Centauri b is the closest super-Earth, sitting at just four light years away. It has a similar mass to Earth's, but a year there is only 11.2 days. Its star even wobbles a bit thanks to the planet's gravity. That's actually how scientists discovered it. The planet sits in the habitable zone but gets blasted by extreme UV radiation because it's super close to its star. Right now we can't even study its atmosphere. And finally, TOI 715b. This one orbits a red dwarf which is smaller and cooler than our sun. These tiny stars are pretty great for finding habitable worlds because planets can orbit close without frying. TOI 715b may have once had a super-thick atmosphere like Neptune's, but it might now be losing it. Scientists need more research to see if it's now a watery, rocky world. In any case, some of these planets might have oceans, some might be way too hot, and some could even be our distant cosmic cousins. Either way, each discovery helps us understand the universe a little better. And who knows? Maybe someday we'll even set foot on one of those super Earths. We just found the biggest clue ever that someone lived on Mars. Or should I say, something. Because if you're picturing skinny red extraterrestrials with big goofy eyes, forget it. The Martians we're talking about looked more like this. A tiny microbe. I know, a total bummer. But this could change everything. See that weird pattern on the rock? 
the one that looks like leopard spots? Experts think it was left behind by ancient life. And no, it's not like someone painted it, the way early humans drew on cave walls. These little marks could actually be leftovers from microbes, signs that some pretty wild chemical reactions were happening back when they were formed. And don't worry, we'll get to that in just a second. So NASA actually found this evidence over a year ago, and they were thrilled as this was exactly the kind of weird rock they had been hoping to see on Mars. They thought this weird pattern might be a biosignature, in other words, a clue that life was once there. That could mean an element, a molecule, some substance, or in this case, a funky leopard print pattern on a rock. But scientists were cautious back then. After all, you can't just go around shouting, we found life on Mars, without being absolutely sure. It could have just been, well, a cool looking Martian rock, right? So, they studied this sample again and again. And by they, I mean more than 1,000 scientists from NASA and partner institutions all over the world. And recently, they finally came out with a paper that basically says, listen, we can't find another explanation. And that's it. With no other explanation left, this might just be the best evidence we've ever had that something really did live on Mars. The sample, nicknamed Sapphire Canyon, was collected by the Perseverance rover in July 2024. It was taken from rocky cliffs along the edges of the Naretva Vallis River Valley, a region shaped long ago by water that once flowed into Jezero Crater. And we're talking like more than 3 billion years ago. Scientists believe that back then, Naretva Vallis was filled with rushing rivers carrying mud, sand, and gravel into the lake. When the water eventually dried up, it left behind the rocky outcrop where Sapphire Canyon was found. After collecting the sample, the Perseverance rover kept exploring the river valley to get a better idea of the environment where those rocks formed, and to figure out how those leopard spots might have appeared. That step matters because knowing exactly how the spots came to be is key to figuring out if the rock really holds signs of life. In other words, did those patterns form through normal chemical processes that don't need life at all? Or were they actually left behind by microbes? What the rover's instruments found is that the rocks in this area are made of clay and silt, which is exciting. Because here on Earth, those materials are great at preserving signs of ancient microbial life. The rocks are also packed with organic carbon, sulfur, oxidized iron, and phosphorus. And you know who loves that stuff? Microbes! Experts think they could have used those ingredients as an energy source, and in the process, left behind the leopard spots we can now see in high-resolution images. Remember when I said these marks might be a microbe's leftovers, right? That's exactly it. Picture you're eating a burger called the Galaxy Burger that has a one-of-a-kind sauce. A drop of that sauce falls on the table. You don't clean it up and a second later, poof, you disappear. Later, detectives show up trying to figure out if you were there. All they find is that sauce drop you left over. From that, they can tell exactly what you were eating the Galaxy Burger. But proving you were really there is tricky, since that sauce could have ended up there in lots of other ways. The same goes for the leopard spots. Just by looking at them, scientists can already tell a few things. For example, the pattern shows the presence of two iron-rich minerals, vivianite and griagite. On Earth, vivianite often turns up in sediments near decaying organic matter or in swampy, soggy wetlands. In a similar way, microbes can also produce griagite on our planet. When you find those two together, it looks like they've formed through electron transfer reactions between the sediment and organic matter. That could be a fingerprint of microbial life, because microbes use those reactions to get energy and grow. So going back to our burger comparison, the leopard spots are like the sauce on the table the leftovers from the process of getting energy. But that's not the only theory. The team also spotted the possible presence of hematite in the rock. And if Mars has the nickname the Red Planet, 
hematite is the one to blame. It's a heavy mineral that can take on a reddish tone. On Earth, people have been using it as a pigment for paint for thousands of years. Now, scientists think the leopard spots may have formed when chemical reactions with hematite turned parts of the rock from red to white. That process can release iron and phosphate and possibly cause those black rings to appear. And here's the kicker. Those reactions can also provide an energy source for microbes. For now, though, these are just theories. What we can confirm is that those chemical compounds are definitely present in the rocks. But just like in the detective story, finding the sauce drop doesn't prove it came from you. So even though these materials are great for microbes to thrive on, it doesn't automatically mean this is a biosignature. They could have also formed abiotically, or put simply, without the presence of life. Yeah, it could happen, but for it to happen naturally, without microbes involved, you'd need two things, high temperatures and acidic conditions. That's the only way those chemical processes could do their magic and leave behind the leopard spots. And here's the exciting part. Scientists didn't find any sign that these Martian rocks were ever exposed to high heat or acidic conditions. That's why I said they're stumped. They just can't find another explanation. So this has to be a biosignature, right? Well, maybe not because there's still a possibility that organic compounds could react even under low temperatures. And maybe, just maybe, we're seeing that happening for the very first time. That's why it's so hard to confirm 100% whether this is the handiwork of ancient microbes or just a natural process. So, in the end, we're still left with more questions than answers. Right now, this precious sample is safely sealed inside a tube millions of miles away on Mars. Hopefully, one day, it'll be brought back to Earth so scientists can study it in labs here. And while we can't confirm it's a biosignature just yet, one thing is certain. This finding by Perseverance is the closest we've ever come to discovering life on Mars. Honestly, just being able to spot a potential biosignature on the red planet is already groundbreaking. Another reason this finding matters has to do with the age of the rock. This evidence comes from some of the youngest sedimentary rocks we've ever studied. Until now, scientists thought that if we ever found signs of ancient life on Mars, they'd most likely be locked inside much older rocks. But so far, nothing has shown up in those ancient formations. Finding a possible biosignature in a young rock suggests two things. First, Mars might have been habitable for longer or later in its history than we ever thought. And second, older rocks might also hold signs of life, but maybe they're just harder to spot. Someday, our technology could be advanced enough to find them. This discovery also makes us think about one of the biggest questions of all, and that is, are we truly alone in the universe, or did we just find the answer? No, not exactly, but it's the closest humanity has ever come to answering that question. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these.